Hello students, so uh, we are going on in our journey um, in Biology 102 and uh, we're going to talk of the system, by the system circulation and respiration because they're intertwined. So this is part three of our series. Uh, the basic problem is that each cell has to trade carbon dioxide and waste products with oxygen and nutrients from its environment and it has to be done by diffusion. So the exchanges can only occur at the cellular level by crossing the plasma membrane. There are two general ways to go about solving this problem. Either each cell has to be in direct contact with the air or um, if the cell organism is multicellular, then then it can't do that because what about the cells that are interior? So then it has to have a circulatory system um, to to do this because every cell needs to trade, and uh, you can't do it if if uh, you're bulky and multi-layered. So um, that is the basic problem because the problem is that uh, the exchange exchanges can only be done by diffusion, and as we know, diffusion is very slow. Um, and it, it, the rate drops uh, by the square of the distance. So it is not only just slow, uh, it can't go in very far, um, very long distances. So for most cells of multicellular organisms, direct exchange with the environment is just simply not possible um, because, they're, like I said, they're buried inside. Gills are an example of a specialized exchange system in animals where oxygen diffuses from the water into the blood vessels and carbon dioxide, which is in higher concentration in the blood, diffuses from the blood into the water. So um, this is um, uh, undergoing the simple laws of diffusion under fixed laws of diffusion. Remember we talked about fixed law of diffusion, yes? Everyone remembers that? Oh, fix law. This is a very funny pen. Um, and internal transport and gas exchange are function functionally related in most animals. So if there is a circulatory system, a respiratory system is present as well. And if a respiratory system is present, then there's always a circulatory system. So these are both interdependent. Small molecules can move between cells and their surroundings by diffusion. Diffusion is a simple process of following a gradient. And it's a movement of from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until equilibrium is attained. Molecules will always move down the concentration gradient towards an area of lesser concentration. And I have a link over here which you can uh, click on yourself and you'll see food coloring spreading out in a glass of water. Sometimes the water is warm, sometimes it's cold, and you'll see how diffusion actually works. Um, it is just a random movement of molecules uh, in the gradient of uh, uh, low concentration down the gradient to uh, the area that has less of it. Here is uh, the same link that you just watched, um, um, but it's in, in uh, just a, a picture here, still form. So here's a drop of, of the dye that was plopped into the glass, and uh, it slowly diffuses until uh, equilibrium is reached. So this would be equilibrium, okay? so. Uh, here, uh, the dye is evenly distributed among all um, parts of that particular beaker or container that it's put in. So the speed of diffusion drops off with the square of the distance, and this is the inverse square law, and we talked about it uh, previously. Um, so for example, if a quantity of glucose <coughs> I beg your pardon. If a quantity of glucose diffuses, um, let's say we have some quantity, and um, it diffuses about 100 micrometers in one second. Well, um, the same quantity will take 100 seconds uh, to diffuse one millimeter. Now, what we're doing is, notice that a micrometer is 10 to the negative 6, and a millimeter is 10 to the negative 3. So we're just going three orders of magnitude, but notice that from one second, now we're going 100 seconds, three orders of magnitude away. So is it, that's not very good. Um, in fact, that's terrible. 100 seconds is, is almost two minutes. So um, if we need the glucose like right away inside the cell, uh, that's not going to happen because uh, one millimeter uh, down 
uh, the cell that's sitting there is never going to get it. Um, or you would, uh, the same quantity of glucose would take about 100, uh, 10,000 seconds, about three hours, to diffuse one centimeter. And that's, that's another order of magnitude from this one. Uh, notice from 100 seconds, this goes to 10,000 seconds, so that's awfully bad. Um, so this is why it is called, it drops off with the square of the distance, it's the inverse square law. And uh, these time frames are not suitable for life, hence a circulatory system needs to be superimposed on the respiratory system, so that's why we have to have both. Um, uh, just a reminder of prefixes, so remember nano is 10 to the negative 9, micro is 10 to the negative 6, and on the other side giga is 10 to the 9th and mega is 10 to the 6th. So we do know this, uh, we're, this is just a quick reminder on, on uh, the uh, um, uh, powers. Uh, how does the inverse square law, so uh, how does it work? Well, um, we are always talking about uh, projection into um, a sphere. And um, if we have a source of power, um, like at a point, well, it's going to, and it's projecting light, um, it's going to project light 360 degrees around it. So it'll project it in the front, in the back, around every side, so it'll be everywhere. Uh, and um, it will describe a complete sphere around itself. And so if we um, look at the intensity of that particular light at the surface of the sphere, and let's just say um, we take a, so since it's a sphere, it would have a radius, no? So let's say at the radius of one, and it could be any unit, uh, meter, centimeter, millimeter, anything. So let's say at the radius of one, uh, we have this particular area carved out, okay? So uh, we're looking at the sphere, and at the radius of one, we're just going to look at a small um, area. Well, when we increase the radius and we double it, the area has not doubled. It has actually increased by four times. Um, and so the inverse square law now is in operation because it went from one to one fourth. And so if we increase the radius now to three, um, and now the inverse square law has, uh, you can see it in operation again. So now it is one ninth um, the intensity as it was from here. So um, it's sort of like having a bucket of paint. And um, let's say you're in a very small broom closet. Well, you have plenty of paint to paint that the interior of that broom closet. Let's say um, you're given the same bucket of paint and you're put in a, a, a bedroom. Well, hmm, I'm not so sure that you could, you might be able to, to paint the entire bedroom, the interior of it, every wall. You might be able to touch it up. You might have to spread it really, really thin. Uh, but let's say you take the same bucket of paint and you're said, uh, okay, now go paint this ballroom. Well, <laughs> that might be very difficult to do. So um, it, it is exactly like that. Uh, they, the farther you get, the less you're going to get, but it doesn't um, drop off proportionally. It drops, drops off by the square of the distance. Plants and animals cannot use molecules which are in gaseous phase uh, under normal conditions for uptake into their cells. And all of these gases have to be dissolved in, the wa in water for cells to be able to use them. And uh, similarly, life cannot use solids. So solid phase is bad for us too. Um, all these solids need to be dissolved in water before a cell can use them. Um, so the cell medium is liquid. It can only understand liquid. It cannot understand or talk in uh, the other phases. Um, but diffusion has limitations. Diffusion is only efficient over small distances because the time it takes to diffuse is proportional to the square of the distance like we just saw. In smaller, very thin animals, cells can exchange materials directly with the surrounding medium. But in most animals, cell exchange, cells exchange materials with the environment through a fluid-filled circulatory system. Um, so some animals will, that are primitive will actually lack an, a circulatory system. I did say that if you have a respiratory system, you have to have a circulatory system. But uh, you, while you do have to breathe, 
um, if you're very, very simple, you might get away with not having a real circulatory system. Uh, and there are uh, some cnidarians that have elaborate gastrovascular cavities, which function in both digestion and in the distribution of, of uh, substances throughout the body. So they press into service the, the, the gastro. Uh, gastric system, the um, alimentary canal, into moving the stuff around. The body that encloses the gastrovascular cavity is only two cells thick. So remember, we just saw that uh, in uh, two slides ago, uh, how many orders of magnitude it, it slows down the rate of diffusion. Well, um, if you went from a micrometer to a millimeter and then to a centimeter. So um, these animals are only two cells thick. And flatworms, for instance, have a gastrovascular cavity and they have a very flat body and that will minimize the diffusion distances. And this is a planaria and uh, he also has a very, very, very thin um, uh, cavity. So a circulatory system is, what is it? It's a transport system. Um, it transports things. So to transport things, you need a few key elements. It's an organ system that permits blood and lymph circulation to transport nutrients, like amino acids and electrolytes, oxygen, carbon dioxide, which is waste, hormones, red and white blood cells to and from the body. But it has to have um, these parts. So you have to have something that pumps that that blood or um, nutrients. You have to have something that pumps that liquid uh, full of nutrients. So that would be your heart or uh, some sort of muscle. You have to have a network of tubes, um, both to and from this pump. Um, so you have to have a pump and then you have to have a network of tubes that go from it and come back to it so that the uh, liquid is transported. And then, of course, you have to have the liquid too, right, um, to convey all these materials that are suspended in it or dissolved in it. Animals have a choice of um, choosing between an open or a closed circulatory system, depending on how efficient they want to be. Um, circular systems can be open or closed, and they vary in the number of circuits in the body. Bugs and shellfish, shellfish which are lower forms of life, they have an open system. All the organs of the body are bathed in the circulatory, the circulatory fluid, and that's why when you step on a bug, uh, you go squish, and all that stuff comes out. Um, in open systems, Fluid movement is due to both body movements as well as a very, very faint heart pump. So um, here is a grasshopper. And what you see in here is an open circulatory system. And uh, it's represented diagrammatically over here. So you have the heart. Um, you know, it pumps. And then it sends out uh, this fluid uh, to all the cells. But um, notice it's open. The cells don't actually, this is not connected in any way to here. Um, so the heart is pumping and it's just sending and then that's it. Um, so this is uh, not going to be very horribly efficient. However, um, it does work because we do have bugs that um, live, right? So uh, what you have is in, in these segments of the bug, you have um, repeated units of hearts. And then you'll have these, these um, um, sinuses, as they call them, where they open up to the outside and um, they communicate with the atmosphere itself. So these are called tubular hearts, um, and it's an open circulatory system because it's open to the atmosphere. In a closed circulatory system, um, it's considered closed because the medium of transport, that is blood, is actually enclosed in vessels. Uh, there, we still have the interstitial fluid or lymph, uh, as all cells still need to be bathed in liquid at all times. The exchange is done at two levels, between the blood and lymph and between lymph and cells. So now you have two, it's a two-step thing. So you can uh, have it between the blood and the lymph, and then uh, once it gets into the lymph, then you go from the lymph to the cells, right? So uh, you could, uh, or you could go directly. But what is the cost and why don't, doesn't everybody use this? Because it sounds like an awfully good plan. Well, uh, open systems cost less in terms of energy to maintain. They're less organized. 
there's less hydrostatic pressure to be maintained, so the cost is very little in terms of energy. Closed systems, however, have to maintain a high blood pressure. Uh, these systems are very efficient in delivering the materials, but they're much more costly in terms of energy expenditure. Again, the more costly systems do allow the animals to be faster and bigger, so it's a trade-off. Uh, so do you want to be quick and fast and spend a lot of energy developing this really good uh, system, which is closed, or do you want to be um, not the smartest pencil in the box and um, you know have an open system? But then you know you're not really spending a lot of energy either. So what do you want to do? Which which way do would you like to go? So um, there is a trade-off. In closed circuitry systems, um, these are, are present in humans and other vertebrates, and we call this the cardiovascular system. The three main types of blood vessels in the cardiovascular systems are arteries, veins, and capillaries, and the blood flow is one way, one way in these vessels. It's only one way. It can only go in one direction, and there is nothing going back, no backsies. Um, in cir single circulation, so let's let's look at the simpler forms of circulatory systems that are closed. Um, so you could have a single circulation system. In vertebrate hearts that have uh, two or more chambers, uh, generally they have at least two. Well, blood will enter through an atrium, and it's going to be pumped out through another chamber, which is usually called the ventricle. And um, uh, simpler animals, simpler vertebrates like bony fishes and rays and sharks, they have single circulation systems with a two-chambered heart. Um, in the single circulation system, the blood that leaves the heart passes through, through two capillary beds before coming back. Okay, one bed will oxygenize, uh, oxygenate it, and the other one will um, deliver the food to the um, system. So here's a here is a picture of what I'm talking about. So here we have this heart. Okay, it's just got two chambers. Yeah. Uh, well, um, if it's blue, then it's oxygen poor. If it's red, uh, then it's oxygen rich. So the heart is going to pump it into um, the uh, place where it gets more oxygen, which would be the gills. And uh, once the uh, gills produce, uh, give it a lot of oxygen, then um, this blood is going to go into the rest of the body, you know, uh, wherever it needs to go. And then it comes back, it's nutrient poor, it's oxygen poor, it's all blue. Um, and it's going to go into the heart, which will pump it and send it off um, to, to the lungs again. Actually, the blood in the veins is not going to be nutrient pure, poor, it's going to be nutrient rich because that's where the food has actually been um, uh, synthesized inside the body. So this blood is oxygen rich, but nutrient poor. So that would be the red one. And the blue blood is oxygen poor but nutrient rich and that's going to be this blue side right um, so you can see it's not horribly efficient not the best idea but it works um, and uh, you know but, but then you have limitations you know you can't really do um, uh, certain things um, you can't um, become a certain size. There are sharks that become really, really big, uh, but uh, they're never as big as a whale. In the double circulation system, so double circulation is uh, reserved for higher animals. Um, amphibians don't have a true double circulation system, but mammals do have a double circulation system. Um, here, what we do is we separate the oxygen poor and the oxygen rich blood, and you pump them separately from a right and left side of the heart. So you segregate um, the oxygen poor blood from the oxygen rich blood. So there's no mixing and um, there's no no mess up like that, no loss. Um, we want to be very efficient. In reptiles and mammals, oxygen poor blood flows through the pulmonary circuit to pick up oxygen through the lungs. And in amphibians, oxygen poor blood flows through a pulmocutaneous circuit 
to pick up oxygen to the lungs and the skin because um, amphibians have very um, thin, porous skin, and so they also breathe through their skin. What are the benefits of a double circulation system? It's very, well, it's very horribly energy expensive, but oxygen-rich blood will deliver oxygen throughout the systemic circuit. And double, double circulation will maintain higher blood pressure in the organs um, than single circulation could, could ever do. And the right side of the heart is only involved in one function, and one function only, which is oxygenating the blood. And the left side of the heart is only responsible for sending all this oxygenated blood to all parts of the body, so it's, it gives it a big push. Um, so the left ventricle has to be very thick and powerful. Uh, that muscle is very thick because it has to send blood to the tips of your toes. Here we look at an amphibian. So an amphibian actually doesn't have four chambers. It doesn't have two. It has three. So it's uh, kind of in between, like it's in between. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a true um, reptile, and it's not true... Fish, so it's kind of in between. And uh, we have three chambers, so what we have is um, two atria, mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately only one ventricle. So that's kind of a bummer. But um, what, what we're doing here, so, but it's a good idea. It, it starts out really good. Um, so what we have is uh, on the um, um, on this side, what you see is, so this would be uh, your right and this is the left. Um, on the right-hand side, um, what you're seeing is uh, really bad blood, uh, I mean oxygen-poor blood uh, here, but nutrient-rich, going into the right side of the heart and uh, getting uh, pushed into those lonely one ventricle. However, uh, at the same time, this um, left side of the heart, which has one uh, atrium, uh, what is happening here is um, all the blood that is coming, oxygenated blood, is mixing in and coming in and pouring in um, and going into the ventricle. Well, it's only one ventricle. So in this ventricle, on this side, you have oxygen-poor blood. On this side, you have oxygen-rich blood. And in the middle, you have kind of in-between. Um, and then this entire chamber will um, empty out and send, push the blood down this way um, into the systemic circuit. So uh, not a horribly efficient way of doing it, but, but not so bad. In the double circulation system in mammals, uh, there is no ambiguity. Yeah, uh, one side is going to do just one thing, and that's it. So here is the right side, and here is the left side, and the right side only oxygenates, and the left side only sends it to the rest of the body. So uh, there is uh, uh, no um, problems in mixing or matching or uh, messing up anything. Um, in the double circulatory system, um, besides um, the uh, good oxygen-laden blood sent, being sent to the rest of the body, um, we should also now start to look at the respiratory system because that's the whole purpose. Where is this nice oxygen coming from? Well, we breathe it in. So we inhale uh, oxygen, we inhale atmospheric oxygen. And uh, uh, as you remember, atmospheric oxygen is only, uh, so the atmosphere uh, is 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen, yes. Um, so um, in uh, we, we're going to breathe in a nice big slug of oxygen, um, and when we breathe it in, it goes in through uh, our lungs into these very tiny little spaces called alveoli, and those alveoli are very, very thin, very thin epithelial cells, uh, which are surrounded by capillaries. Well, at the capillary level, oxygen um, from the atmosphere is going to diffuse on in, down the concentration gradient. Um, into the capillaries, and then it's going to go into um, the uh, left oracle, um, atrium uh, of the heart, and uh, it will then be sent down the systemic circuit um, to the rest of the body. Um, and then when it's depleted of oxygen, it will come back into the right at uh, atrium, uh, be pushed out from the right ventricle, 
and go into the lung to get oxygenated. So it serves its purpose and it does its job very, very efficiently. So um, the deal about heart chambers, how many do we need? Well, frogs and uh, other amphibians have a three-chambered heart. They have two atria, uh, but just one ventricle. And uh, the ventricle pumps blood into a forked artery. Uh, so um, the purplish blood is actually going to get split. Um, and uh, the red blood is going to, they're going to try and separate it out um, to send it to the systemic circuit. And the blue blood, they're going to try and send it most of it to the pulmocutaneous circuit. Um, when uh, these amphibians are underwater, the blood flow to the lungs is nearly shut off. Uh, and so therefore, uh, they can't breathe when they're underwater. So they have to take a big gulp of air before they go underwater and then they come back um, and get some more air. So they're called intermittent breathers. Mammals and birds have a four-chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles. The left side of the heart pumps and receives only oxygen-rich blood, while the right side of the heart receives and pumps only oxygen-poor blood. Mammals and birds are endotherms, and they are going to require an awful lot more oxygen than ectotherms. Um, so what is the basic idea of mammalian circulation? Well, blood is flowing from the right ventricle, and that's going to pump it into the lungs by the pulmonary arteries. In the lungs, the, well, wait, uh, let's talk about the pulmonary arteries. So the pulmonary arteries, we know arteries are always vessels that take blood away from the heart. Um, that is true, but arteries always are, except for these, they always are oxygenated. Um, so this is kind of a funny um, artery. It's called an artery, but it's really a vein. Um, but it's an artery in shape, in form, in function. Uh, it just um, uh, the the uh, what it's transporting is not oxygen oxygenated. All right, so that just remember that there's a, that's a little oddity right there. Once the blood is in the lungs, the blood loads oxygen and unloads carbon dioxide. Oxygen rich rich blood from the lungs enters the heart at the left atrium by the pulmonary veins, and it is pumped through the aorta to the body tissues by the left ventricle. Then the blood returns to the right atrium of the heart by the superior and inferior vena cava, and the two atria have thin walls uh, because they're not pushing blood very far, just going down a, a, a notch. They're collection chambers for blood returning to the heart. So here is our um, circulation system, and um, uh, it shows you um, the, all these these numbers. So you can start anywhere, but uh, if you follow these numbers, this is how it was written um, just previously. So you start out in this this area, number one. So that's the right ventricle, and it is going to send a deoxygenated blood into the two lungs. So it'll go this way and that way. Um, and then the blood is going to get oxygenated and it's going to come back from that those two lungs into the left atrium. Um, it's going to push it down, down into the left ventricle and the left ventricle is going to push it into the aorta which will go all the way to the rest of your body. right? And then uh, it will be collected back up by the inferior uh, vena cava or in a superior vena cava depending on where it's coming from the upper or the lower half of your body, and then it comes back into the right atrium and the circuit is complete. So that is uh, the pulmonary circuit and the um, uh, systemic circuit in one or the entire circulatory system. So please remember that arteries carry oxygenated blood away from the heart and veins carry deoxygenated blood back to the heart, except for the pulmonary ones. Um, capillaries which connect the two vessel types are where the actual business of exchange is conducted. So while arteries and veins are awfully nice to have because they're the uh, big transport vessels, um, the real business or the real idea of doing all this transport is to give oxygen and carbon dioxide. All right, um, That can't be done in arteries and veins.
And they're just going to transport it. The actual work is going to be done in capillaries. And um, capillaries connect arteries to veins. And this is where the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen is done. Um, so if we just looked at how many vessels we have, uh, we just put them end to end uh, in one adult. It's about 50,000 miles. 50,000 miles. Um, that's about twice the circumference of the Earth. So we have a lot of vessels inside, a lot of blood vessels inside us. Another picture of the cardiovascular system, I'm not going to go over it because we looked at it just before uh, two seconds ago. And it has the exact same stuff. This time, it actually has, instead of just writing systemic circuit and showing legs, um, it actually shows you the, the, the organs or some of them. So um, that's a little more, bit more detail. Um, but let's look at the arteries. So if you look at an artery, uh, it starts out really, really big, and then it starts to branch into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller arteries and thinner and thinner ones, until finally it becomes one cell thick, loses all its muscle, and it becomes a capillary. Okay, so the capillaries are these things. And then the capillaries, um, it, this is where the business of unloading oxygen occurs and uh, loading up of carbon dioxide. Um, so now this blood is full of uh, carbon dioxide and all these capillaries will join up and become a vein. And these veins will ultimately um, em empty up into the right atrium of the heart. Um, here is another version of looking at this with a whole bunch of arrows. Uh, and this time it actually adds in um, some valves to show you that uh, when the valves are closed, then blood cannot go back. And remember very early on I said blood can only go one way. Well, there are ways to make sure it only goes one way. So from the right atrium to the right ventricle, there is uh, the avia, uh, atrioventricular valve. Uh, it's also called the tricuspid valve. Um, but if you look at the right, the left atrium and the left ventricle, um, we have a, a, a bicuspid valve. Um, and then from um, the ventricles going into the arteries that uh, lead off from it. So if you're going from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery, there's going to be this semilunar valve, which is going to block off access to the blood so it can't go back and it only goes forward. All right, so these are all uh, kind of um, valves which help us in circulation. Here is another a picture of the same uh, idea, but maybe a little less complicated because it shows you the right in blue, which is deoxygenated, and the left in red, which is oxygenated. Um, so let's look at the cardiac cycle. The heart contracts and relaxes in a rhythmic cycle called the cardiac cycle. The contraction or the pumping phase is called systole. And the relaxation or the filling phase is called diastole. All right. Uh, and here we're going to go step by step through the cardiac cycle. So um, when you have um, atrial and ventricular diastole, so diastole, remember, is relaxation, and um, nothing is pumping at that time. So that takes about 0.4 seconds of relaxation. And then um, you have atrial systole, which is pumping. So these were the two uh, atria pumping. Um, and since it doesn't take that long for the blood to go anywhere, it's just going down a notch into the ventricles. So it only takes 0.1 seconds. Um, remember, the ventricles are still relaxing. They're not doing anything. And then uh, the third part is um, the atria don't do anything. And um, the ventricles are going to be pushing blood to the rest of the body. And so that takes 0.3 seconds. So um, if you add it all up, uh, it one beat doesn't take one minute, um, uh, one second. It, it, so we have about 72 beats per minute. Um, so uh, one beat takes about 0.8 seconds. And that is because um, there is a big significant part of it, which is in diastole, where both parts are just doing nothing. Um, for 0.4 seconds, it just rests. 
uh, while the blood is out there doing its thing and not in the heart. Um, so there are four valves that prevent backflow. The uh, AV valve uh, separates each atrium and ventricle. The semilunar valves control, control blood flow to the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And when you listen to your heart uh, with a stethoscope or just by putting your ear next to somebody's chest, you hear a lub-dub sound. And that sound of the heartbeat is caused by the recoil of blood against the AV valves, which is uh, the valves that separate the atrium and the ventricle, and that sounds more like a lump. And then uh, you hear the recoil of the blood against the semilunar valves, um, and that's where you, uh, that's when the blood is being pushed out in, from the ventricles, and that's where you hear it like a tup. So it's lump, tup, lump, tup. That's, that's uh, the two sounds. Um, the common terms, so let's go over these really fast because you do, you should know these. And the cardiac cycle is systole plus diastole. So it's about eight seconds, 0.8 seconds. Uh, systole is contraction of the heart and that takes about 0.7 seconds. Diastole is relaxation of the heart, takes about 1 sec 0.1 seconds. Cardiac output is the volume of blood pumped per minute by each ventricle. Cardiac output is determined by heart rate and by stroke volume. Um, and uh, the heart rate is the pulse. So that would be the number of beats per minute. That's usually 72 beats per minute. The stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped in one contraction. Well, uh, we don't contract an awful lot of blood. Uh, we just send out 70 milliliters um, in, in one contraction. But remember, the heart is continuously pumping. So it sends out a slug of 70 milliliters and another slug of 70 milliliters and another slug of 70. So they keep on coming right after the other. So the cardiac output is uh, defined as the heart rate times the stroke volume. So 72 times 70, that's about 5 liters per minute. Um, so that's how much we pump in one minute. Valves, what do they do? Their function is to prevent backflow. That's why they're there. So let's look at the sequence of a heartbeat um, in electrical terms. And uh, the term that if you go to the doctor, that they may do an EKG on you. So that's looking at the electricity. Uh, so let's let's see, how does it actually work? Why? Why does a heartbeat like this? And why does it always work in this sequence? Well, there's a control. And uh, there's a pacemaker, which sets the rate and the timing at which the cardiac muscle cells have to contract. And that pacemaker is called a sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node sits on top of the right atrium. It sends an electrical signal to the walls of the atria, and the atria will contract. Then, uh, it will, this, will, this, will, this contraction will send a signal to the next node, which is the atrioventricular node, which will say stop. It will delay the impulse for 0.1 seconds to allow complete emptying of the atria. So um, when you have the atria contracting, um, you want all of the blood to go out. And so um, you don't want the, um, uh, some of it to be left in there. So that's why there's a little delay of 0.1 seconds to allow the emptying of the atria. And then uh, after the, this delay, there's a signal that's sent to the ventricles by the Purkinje fibers, which are in the, um, on, on top of the ventricles, and they will make the ventricles contract. So let's look at this. Um, here is the sequence of a heartbeat, the electrical sequence. So signals are going to be um, the parts that are in yellow, and they're going to spread through the atria. So this is the first part. The uh, pacemaker node sits here. All right, um, and when it sends a signal, this is what we see, the first crest in the EKG. And uh, what it's going to send a signal is, it'll tell the atria, contract. And then uh, the signals are, are then sent. Once the atria contract, the signal is sent to the AV node, and it tells everything, stop. And that is this tiny little part where you see nothing nothing going on um, and that is delayed so the atria can actually empty out completely and then um, you have the signal going from the AV node from here um, into the Purkinje fibers down here uh, which will then tell the ventricles contract 
and that is this part in the EKG se sequence. And then um, the last part is the signal will spread from the protein G fibers, uh, go through the uh, ventricles and say, okay, you guys contract. And that is a huge spike that you see in EKG. All right, so the first one is a small one. This is contraction also. And the second one is really big because remember the atria don't have to contract that hard. So they have a very small spike, whereas the ventricles do have to contract very hard. And so they, there's this gigantic spike from that. The regulation of the heartbeat, uh, the pacemaker, how is that regulated? That is regulated by both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions of the central nervous system. The sympathetic division speeds up the pacemaker. The parasympathetic division slows down the pacemaker. Um, so there, it's a constant uh, tug and, and it's, it's a constant push and pull. Um, it's, it's always in balance, so you don't have to have the same speed um, to, if your environment changes. So you need to have both these controls. The pacemaker is also regulated by hormones and also by temperature. Um, here is another picture of the entire sequence of the heartbeat. And uh, here are some um, very nice links, which I'm going to allow you to click on one by one. Please click on them. Um, the first one will show you how the heart beats, and um, you'll see a whole bunch of others, and they're all very useful. So please click on them one by one and then come back to me. All right, well, I'm glad you clicked on all of them, and uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed them. I put them in a certain sequence so that uh, I thought you would like it that way. Um, let's look at arteries. Arteries, these are the vessels now that are conveying this blood. Arteries have an outer layer of connective tissue and that's made out of elastic fibers. And then those surround a middle layer of smooth muscle, that, those, that means involuntary, with more elastic fibers. The elastic fibers have elastic recoil, which helps keeps keep the pressure constant. Um, the interior of an artery is lined with endothelium. Veins. Um, they have the same two layers of tissue surrounding interior uh, layer of the endothelium, but veins are about as uh, one third as thick as uh, arteries, so they don't have a very thick wall. And why is that? Because they don't really need um, that much elastin. Uh, nothing is really pushing it that hard so it doesn't need to expand that much. So there's lower pressure in the veins, and so there's not a lot of need for the elastin. Uh, but, but veins do contain valves because that is going to allow it uh, to have unidirectional flow, and so there's no backflow. So that's the difference between arteries and veins. Veins have valves, and arteries do not. Um, what you see over here is uh, the direction of the blood going up uh, a vein. Okay, and what you see here um, are valves. Every frequent, very, very short intervals, there are valves. And the blood is also being pushed by the muscles that move around as you move around um, in veins. So if you don't move for a long time, you might actually see maybe fluid buildup um, um, in your feet uh, because you know the the it's not it's working but you really need to get up a little bit and move around so these muscles can help blood go back to the heart so uh, this shows you the structure of the blood vessels um, here is an artery notice how nice and thick it is um, this is the layer of connective tissue then there's a layer of smooth muscle, and then there's a layer of endothelium. Uh, and if you looked at it uh, under a microscope, you would actually see this entire uh, apparatus spread out like this. Uh, what you see inside is, is actually just red blood cells. So if you look at the vein, notice the vein um, may be almost the same size as an artery, but, but um, uh, the connective tissue is thin, the, the um, muscle is definitely thin. Um, and the endothelium is about the same. So um, what you, if you looked at, if you cut a vein um, and looked at it under the microscope, this is what you would see. No, this doesn't really mean that, you know, veins have a lot of blood. I know this picture shows you that, but it doesn't really mean that at all. Uh, what we're really looking at uh, is the structure of um, the veins. And notice there's always a valve in a vein. And then um, connecting these two are capillaries.
All right, so capillaries are single cell thick and uh, they've lost everything. So they don't have the smooth muscle. All they have is the endothelium and a very, 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 very thin layer of connective tissue. Um, in fact, if you look at this actual capillary, you see this one layer of cell, just one. Um, and um, the blood cells, the red blood cells, these same things that we saw so many millions of over here, were here, they actually have to go s in single file to be able to get through a capillary. They stand up and they walk through um, in single file. Sometimes they have to squish a little bit. Here is a much better and bigger picture of this without my scribbling on it. Um, what happens in capillaries? So uh, blood has to travel a lot slower in capillaries to allow diffusion to occur for the gases to exchange. In fact, it travels about 500 times slower in capillaries than in the main artery. So the rate in the main artery is about 0.1 centimeters per second um, in the aorta, but in the capillaries, it's about 48 centimeters per second. And that is awfully slow. Well, how and why? These are the two questions you would ask because the number of capillaries is much, 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 much more than the number of arteries. So that would slow it down really fast. Um, and let's just think about it. So if you have a really um, big river, like the mighty Mississippi, and it's rushing down, um, well, it'll rush down. And then when it comes to um, meet the ocean, it's going to break up into tributaries and you have this big uh, area where the water slows down. So um, that's because it's no longer one channel. There's a ton of little channels. So all the water is distributed around. So it's going to flow slower. And that's the same idea with capillaries. And the number of capillaries is much, much more than the number of arteries. So the cross-sectional area is going to increase. Also, uh, one thing which is kind of cool to know is that arteries will dilate when entering a capillaries, uh, so the blood will flow even slower, and also not to rip the capillary, because the capillary, remember, has no muscle at all, no elastin, and uh, if the blood goes in a little bit too fast, we're going to have uh, the poor little endothelial cells uh, fall apart or rip or lose their grip with the next endothelial cell, and you'll have... Um, some blood flowing out, which we don't want. Um, so here is a picture that shows you that actually to slow down the blood, um, there might be some sphincters or little muscles that will make sure that the blood is actually slowed down. All right, so um, this just shows you um, blood moving and uh, the presence of sphincters to slow down the blood in the capillaries. We want it to go really, really slow. And here's a picture of a great big river. Um, so it's just the idea that blood will squirt from our artery because it's going really fast. It will flow from a vein, but it will only ooze from a capillary. The elasticity of arteries calls, causes the blood to flow even when the heart is resting between pumps. And that is why your diastolic blood pressure is never zero. So um, you don't go down when the heart isn't, when there's no contraction um, of uh, the ventricles, the, your blood pressure doesn't go to zero. It, it, it is still about 60 to 70. Um, this shows you if the area is narrow, uh, water will move much, much faster. Uh, if the area is big, then the water is gonna move a whole lot slower. Blood flows from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure. So this is the same idea we've been talking about before, too. But this is the pressure that the blood pushes in all directions against the walls of the blood vessels. And the resistance to blood flow in the narrow diameters of the tiny capillaries and the arterioles will dissipate much of this pressure. And that is uh, known as blood pressure. So we can see it in a graph. And um, I know this graph looks a little bit scary, but I, just, um, I wouldn't really consider it scary. But let's look at it um, step by step. So uh, uh, we're, we're going to look at just one graph at one time. And it's going to start making sense. So let's look at the aorta. Uh, and, and let's just look at uh, the pressure. So we do know 
that um, you know they, uh, uh, when the atrium is relaxed, um, there's no pressure in the aorta, and when uh, the atrium, uh, uh, when the ventricle is uh, contracting, there's a whole lot of pressure. Okay, so we see that, no pressure, lots of pressure, no pressure, lots of pressure, and so this is this is cool. We see this, um, and and uh, this is in the aorta all the way from here. But then when you get to smaller and smaller arteries. Well, um, you know, the, the pressure has been, the blood has been distributed into many, 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 many arteries. So now they have smaller and smaller pressure. Well, when you come to the capillaries uh, and the pressure is going to actually uh, keep on going down. Um, you get to the veins and actually there isn't going to be any pressure left because um, it was slowed down in the capillaries and now there's no pressure to push it. All right, we'll talk about this problem in a minute. Um, let's talk about the velocity. Velocity in the arteries, pretty fast. Um, velocity is slowing down as we go into the capillaries. In the capillaries, the velocity is like zero. Um, but then the velocity starts to pick up in the veins. It never gets back to the level of um, uh, speed that you had in the arteries, but it still is uh, pretty decent. Um, and, and so when we look at um, the area, so an artery will have a certain area, um, but as you start branching this artery and you make it into smaller and smaller, you're going to get more and more and more area. The capillaries have the most surface area, and then as you get into the veins and they get bigger and bigger, you again have less and less surface area. That's all this really tells you. So it's um, the same stuff I talked about, but now it's depicted in a graph uh, pictorially and in pretty colors. So there are some terms of blood pressure that you should know. Systolic pressure is the pressure in the arteries during the ventricle, ventricular systole. And the highest pressure uh, in the arteries is usually about 120 milligrams, millimeters of mercury. That is um, a textbook ideal blood pressure, uh, the systolic blood pressure. So that's that's really a good number. If you're very healthy, you, sh you should have 120 millimeters of mercury systolic pressure. The diastolic pressure is the pressure in the arteries during diastole. It's lower than the systolic pressure, and it's usually about 70 millimeters of mercury. So uh, if you go to the doctor, he'll usually write something like this. And this just means this is systole, and this means it's diastole, and, um, and that's just shorthand. Well, uh, if uh, you're an animal with a very long neck, um, you're going to need a really, really high systolic blood pressure to pump the blood a big distance against gravity. Um, so like giraffes, they would have this problem. Um, the, uh, what is a pulse? So we need to know what a pulse is. It's the rhythmic bulging of artery walls with each heartbeat and you can count your pulse. Um, how do we regulate blood pressure? We can do that. Arterial blood pressure can be altered by changing the diameter of the arterioles. Uh, so you can, uh, you did remember that uh, arteries have uh, elastic in them. So they can either get, uh, uh, they can relax or they can contract. And you can change the pressure right there. When would this happen? Well, vasoconstriction will cause the increase of blood pressure due to the contraction of the small muscle, a smooth muscle in the arterioles. And you see this when you get scared and you go pale. So uh, your arteries are contracting. Um, vasodilation uh, will cause blood pressure to fall because the smooth muscles are going to get relaxed. And you will see this uh, when your face is red by either flushing or blushing. Uh, now we come to osmotic pressure. Uh, what is, so we talked about blood pressure, but what's osmotic pressure? So osmotic pressure is the result of uh, what's in the fluid that's being moved. Um, proteins are dissolved in the blood, um, but some of them are really, really too big. And so they can't pass through the endothelial cells of the arterioles, so they kind of just stay there. And because they're there, they cause pressure. And these blood proteins are responsible for creating this osmotic pressure, which helps keep the blood inside the capillary. So they don't just hang around for no reason. They're there for a purpose, and they're there to keep the blood inside the capillaries. Um, the osmotic pressure is pressure resulting from a concentration gradient across 
a semipermeable membrane. The exchange of substances between blood and interstitial fluid, also known as lymph, takes place across the thin endothelial walls of the capillaries. The difference between blood pressure and osmotic pressure drives fluids out of capillaries at the arterial end and into capillaries at the venual end. So uh, this is why uh, there is um, um, blood that's always flowing, even though at the capillaries, you would think, you know, so if a river empties out into an ocean, pressure's gone. The ocean is never going to form right back up into little tiny um, rivers and then become another mighty Mississippi, Mississippi River on the other side, is it? No, um, but but in our bodies, we do have that. We have capillaries and then capillaries will join back up, uh, become another bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger vessel, uh, which will bring blood back to the heart. Um, so uh, we have to have a mechanism to do that. And that is from osmotic pressure, blood pressure, and also because it's a closed circulatory system. Um, because it's closed, then the blood has no other place to go. There is one slug of 70 milliliters of blood coming, and there's one right after that, and it keeps coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, um, so the blood is just pushed along uh, regardless, and so you uh, would get your blood back. Here is another picture of blood pressure and osmotic pressure, and it shows you what is happening. So here's the direction of the blood flow. Mm -hmm. So this is an artery over here and a vein over here. Um, and so what you're having, if you look at the red arrows, so that's the blood pressure really high in the arteries. Uh, osmotic pressure is, is not going to change. It's because of the presence of those big proteins. Uh, well, you keep going. Um, you're going to keep on losing some, some lymph. And uh, you notice that this arrow has gone down. Um, the osmotic pressure is going to stay the same. Uh, well, you keep going, and finally you're going to see the uh, blood pressure going even much less uh, when you're in capillaries. And then um, the osmotic pressure is still the same. But uh, when you get to the venous end of the capillary, uh, you're at the lowest osmotic uh, uh, blood pressure. Um, while the osmotic pressure is still the same. So if this wasn't there, um, this would go all the way down. All right, so that's why we have it. The slow flow of blood in the capillaries allows it to leak out into the interstitial spaces as lymph. That is another reason why we would slow it down. Lymph is basically blood without red blood cells. About four to eight liters of blood is leaked out as lymph every single day. An exchange of materials is in the interstitial fluid or the lymph to and from the cell. Um, what is lymph? Well, lymph is the fluid which leaves the capillary at the arterial end. It carries oxygen, proteins, glucose, and other nutrients to the cells. And at the venous end, the fluid re-enters the capillary carrying the cellular waste products and carbon dioxide produced by those cells. Here is a picture showing you um, what I, sh I just talked about. This is the interstitial fluid circulation. So here is blood pressure, osmotic pressure. Um, notice over here, blood pressure, osmotic, osmotic pressure doesn't change. It's still 25 over here, yeah. Um, and it just shows you um, going from the artery into the vein, um, where things are going in and what things are going out. Uh, so that is a really nice diagram showing that. The lymphatic system is present because it'll bring back all the leaked out lymph or interstitial fluid back to the heart. We don't want it just hanging around over there. We want it to come back so it can leak out again. Uh, similar to the circulatory system, tiny vessels joining up to become bigger vessels, which ultimately drain into the right atrium. So it's very similar. It's a similar system and it sort of looks like this. So it's not as extensive, uh, and notice it's not as extensive because it doesn't need both sides. It doesn't need the arterial side because nothing is leaking out from the arteries. It's only leaking out um, uh, in, uh, in the veins. Um, it's coming back in the capillaries. Um, the, the capillaries are where all the lymph is. So and what we have is um, the lymphatic system. And that's why it's just is 
these areas you know the blue stuff they're not that much uh, it returns fluids that leak out from the capillary beds into veins uh, and uh, they go and um, empty out into the heart they are valves and lymph vessels and they will prevent the backflow of the fluid just like their valves in in uh, veins um, here is uh, another picture of uh, more lymphatic ducts and where they empty out. So we have um, lymph being brought back all the time. Um, Deoxygenated blood, what happens to it? Because all this was just build up to the respiratory system. All this time that we've spent, we were just trying to get to the respiratory system, which is where we really wanted to exchange the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. Well, oxygen is offloaded to the cells and nutrients pass out of the cells into the lymph. And after this exchange, blood passes into venules, which join up to become big veins. And veins have bigger diameters, so the total cross-sectional area is now going to decrease, which is going to speed up the blood flow. And valves in the veins will also help maintain the speed. Um, how does the blood get back? Well, uh, this is a nice um, diagram which shows you uh, there's pressure that is moving in all directions so there's no net downward force um, and then you have internal body fluid pressure which is pushing outward in all directions to balance the air pressure so you feel a no um, net pressure uh, that's great so it's all in contained but um, how would it get back? Well, when we're sitting or standing, the pull of gravity is significant on our venous blood flow, and the veins must fight against gravity to get blood back to the heart. Although veins have valves to keep the blood flowing in the right direction, these only come into play when we are walking or are active. Um, so there is the concept of hydrostatic pressure. Gravity not only affects blood flow in our veins, it is also responsible for the pressure in all of our blood vessels, like the arteries, capillaries, veins, and lymph vessels. This pressure is called hydrostatic pressure, and it's simply the weight of a column of fluid. If the heart is neutral pressure, then anything elevated above the heart will have negative hydrostatic pressure. Anything below will have a positive hydrostatic pressure pressure, the hydro, higher hydrostatic pressure in capillaries results in the net movement of fluid out, and that's how we get lymph out. We use um, these, these rules uh, to, to actually do this. This shows you a picture of hydrostatic pressure, which I just talked about, and it's actually a law. Um, so this has been around a very long time. It tells you how blood gets back when the pressure is zero in the capillaries. So the biggest surprise in the application of this law is, is to fluid flow is the dramatic effect of changing the radius. And um, this, this really tells you a lot. So if we look at this part, um, if we say that the original flow rate, I'm going this way, is 100 cubic centimeters per second. Well, if you double the length, um, you know, uh, the um, we, we, we would get 50, double the viscosity, we'd get double the length, double viscosity, double pressure. But if you change the radius, that is where you see the biggest change. So even a small increase in radius, like maybe a 20% increase, um, that's going to double the flow rate. So that's why it's really, really important uh, to remember that veins get bigger and bigger because of this, and that's it makes the blood go faster and faster back to the heart. Um, so let's see how many times is a heartbeat? 70 times, two times a minute, and there are 60 minutes in an hour. So we um, have about 4,000 beats per hour, the 24 hours in a day. So that's about 100,000 times our heart is beating in a day. Um, there are 365 days in a year. So that's about 70, uh, so that's about 38 million times, uh, 38 million beats per year. And if we live to be about 70, uh, so in 70 years, your heart will have been beating or have uh, completed 2 billion beats, 2.5 billion beats. Well, that's a lot of beating, and um, it doesn't stop, um, and it doesn't mess up. So this is an awfully good organ to have around. 
the composition of blood um, in vertebrates. Let's look at it. So remember, blood is a connective tissue and has several kinds of cells which are suspended in a liquid matrix called plasma. 55% of the blood is plasma and about 45% of it uh, of blood is about uh, is different cells. What are the cells? Well, they could be white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets. Let's look at each one of them. Um, so the white blood cells live for a few hours and there are many kinds of them. Um, so there are lymphocytes, which are white blood cells, and they produce antibodies. We have basophils, and they produce an histamines for in the inflammatory, inflammatory response. Uh, we have the eosinophils, they are white blood cells that go trap large parasites that can't be engulfed. And then we have um, white blood cells called monocytes, and these are migratory phase, phages. And then we have white blood cells uh, that are called neutrophils that go around eating bacteria and fungus. All right, so those are the white blood cells um, in the cell portion of the composition of blood. And um, here is a summary slide where it actually tells you what is in the plasma, which is the other 55%, what are the cellular elements in the 45%. And um, it goes through a nice long list and tells you what are the constituents. So if you look at the plasma, um, well, 90% of it is water. And then there are ions, um, which are sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, then there are plasma proteins, these carry negative charges, and then there are substances transported by the blood like, blood like uh, uh, sugar monomers, waste products, gases, hormones. Um, so these are all uh, things that are sitting around in the plasma. These are our cellular ele elements. So white blood cells have many, 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 many different types. Then we have platelets, and then we have red blood cells, and that's about it. So plasma is similar in composition to the interstitial fluid, but it has a much higher protein concentration. Plasma proteins influence blood pH and help maintain osmotic balance between blood and interstitial fluid. Particular plasma proteins function in a lipid transport, in an immunity, and in blood clotting. Um, and as it was in the chart previously. Plasma contains inorganic salts as dissolved ions, and those are called electrolytes, and they're very important. Um, here is the plasma composition, not in a pictorial um, colored form, but just written out. So plasma is mostly water, about 90% of it is. And then there are ions, which are, uh, so let's, let's take a look at this. Um, potassium ions are for pH balance. Um, so are sodium ions, and then we have uh, calcium ions, osmotic balance. These are for osmotic balance, and then there's more nerve and muscle activity. Proteins. Um, we have proteins in plasma, so albumin will escort lipid molecules. Fibrinogen is responsible for clotting. Immunoglobulin is uh, our proteins that are, produce antibodies or are antibodies. And then there are nutrients in plasma like glucose, fatty acids, vitamins. And then there's me metabolic waste like urea um, and lactic acid. And then there are hormones. So these are all the things that are in the plasma. So uh, red blood cells, let's look at those. About 2.4 million are produced per second. Um, so that's a lot of red blood cells. Uh, about a quarter of all human body cells are actually red blood cells, so we make a lot of them. They live about 100 days. They have no cell nucleus, and that is to accommodate the heme protein molecule, the iron-containing protein that actually transports the oxygen. Hemoglobin transports oxygen, and each molecule of hemoglobin binds to four molecules of oxygen. Um, and the red blood cells can be deformed to accommodate very narrow spaces in capillaries. They can scr scrunch down. Um, there are about 250 million hemoglobin molecules in each red blood cell. So just uh, think of the number. That's a lot of oxygen, uh, oxygen molecules. Every hemoglobin has four iron atoms that are responsible for capturing oxygen in our lungs. So they do a pretty good job at transporting it to all the cells of our body and releasing it there to produce energy by an oxidation process. Here is a picture of the hemoglobin molecule itself, the magical protein 
that has gotten us to where we are today. If you look at this part, these four green centers, these are the iron centers. This is where the oxygen is captured. And here is actually um, one red blood cell. And what you see is if you just take out a little part of it and you tease it out and you actually um, can look at the hemoglobin molecule itself and it gives you the sheer num magnitude of how many hemoglobin molecules um, are packed in one red blood cell. Um, here is an awfully good animation of the heme protein accommodating the oxygen molecule. I would definitely want you to click on this. Um, please do look at it. It shows you how the protein expands and then uh, uh, the oxygen molecule just just runs on in and then it, it, it the protein contracts and so it's kind of caged in um, the oxygen is caged in and then it expands to release it in the, in the cell and then um, the oxygen molecule rushes, rushes out so this goes on on and on and it's awfully cool to look at because um, this is this is true magic so a person of average weight synthesizes approximately 500 trillion molecules of iron containing hemoglobin per second in the bone marrow. So it's a pretty important function. The same number of hemoglobin molecules are destroyed each second and then excreted as part of fecal matter, giving it the color of uh, one form of iron oxide or rust. Uh, so um, let's look at the white blood cells. There are five major types of white blood cells. We looked at these, uh, monocytes, neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and lymphocytes. And their main function is defense, which is to phagocytize bacteria or mount an immune system response against foreign substances. And they're found both inside and outside the circulatory system. Um, so here is a differentiation of uh, blood cells. So let's start in the bone marrow. And what we see is uh, stem cells. Stem cells are so, cells that can differentiate into anything, um, and they can go into two paths. Either they can become lymphoid stem cells, which become T or B cells, and these are responsible for very specific adaptive immune response um, um, targets. So they, they're very target specific and therefore uh, very good in getting rid of uh, bad pathogens. Or you, the stem cell can go in another pathway and this is going to generate all our blood uh, cells. So it will create all the white blood cells. So that one, that one, that one, that one. And then it will create also red blood cells and then it can differentiate into platelets too. So uh, that's what our stem cells can actually do for us. Platelets, what are they? Well, they have no nucleus, um, they, but they're very useful. They've stopped bleeding by forming clots, and they're only found in mammals. We have an, a staggering number of platelets. 10 to the 11th platelets are produced daily. Um, reserve platelets are stored in the spleen, and the average life cycle lifespan of a circulating platelet is about a, a week, eight to nine days. Um, when you have a blood clotting, this is what happens. So let's say um, there's a small rip, a tear in, in a, an artery or a vein or any blood vessel. Well, um, these would be the red blood cells. They're just trying to move and go where they're supposed to. But these platelets are saying, hmm, uh, there's a hole. Let's start plugging it up. So it's going to make a little plug. And uh, in the plug will fall some, some red blood cells and then uh, some proteins which are already floating around in the blood, uh, fibrinogen, will actually trap them over there and then you get a scab um, and um, uh, th this is uh, all done rather quickly because we don't want to uh, bleed to death. Here is an awfully beautiful picture of a blood clot. I know it sounds funny, pretty picture of a blood clot, which sounds icky, but um, these are red blood cells that are caught in uh, threads of fibrin, and that is what a, a clot is actually made out of. So if you really looked at it, it's actually very pretty. Here is a family portrait, and it gives you about the sense of scale or size. Um, so we have the red blood cell over here it's a nice donut looking shaped thing white blood cell on the right hand side um, all those 
finger like projections and then the platelet in the middle uh, which is a sort of a scrunchy looking thing and uh, doesn't even look like a complete cell so finally we're at the part that we've discussed all this um, and now we're finally at the part which is like dessert we're going to talk about respiration so respiratory surfaces animals require large moist respiratory surfaces for exchange of gases between their cells and the respiratory medium either air or water so there are only two gases exchange across respiratory surfaces um, i'm sorry gases gas exchange across respiratory surfaces takes place by diffusion lungs are an infolding of the body surface the size and complexity of lungs correlates with the metabolic rate of the organism so let's look at the respiratory system it's not that complex it's really just not that many things um, you have a nasal cavity so this is where the air is taken in um, once it's taken in it's it goes here where it's warmed uh, humidified and uh, big coarse particles are trapped by cilia um, then it goes into the larynx um, and then into the ph pharynx um, and then uh, the uh, I'm sorry the pharynx and the larynx and then the trachea and um, once it goes into the trachea then the trachea divides into two bronchi uh, the bronchi immediately divide into bronchioles and the bronchioles uh, terminate in little sacs called air uh, alveoli or air sacs um, here is the heart which is uh, right in between the lungs and then we have a diaphragm which separates uh, the upper cavity from the lower cavity uh, or the digestive cavity so um, a system of branching ducts conveys air to the lungs so you saw that in that picture you have you go from trachea to bronchi to bronchioles air inhaled through the nostrils is filtered warmed humidifies and then the pharynx is going to direct air to the lungs air passes through the pharynx larynx trachea bronchi bronchioles to the alveoli where the actual gas exchange occurs the right ventricle is going to push deoxygenated blood into the lungs via the pulmonary artery inside the lung the artery is going to divide into arterioles which further divide into capillaries which surround the alveoli of lungs and gas exchange takes place in the alveoli which are the air sacs at the tips of bronchioles um, oxygen diffuses through the moist film of the epithelium and into the capillaries and carbon dioxide diffuses from the capillaries across the epithelium into the airspace of the alveoli so here is a picture of where all this is happening and um, it shows you these bunches of grapes which are really the air sacs or the alveoli um, so bronchioles are terminating in bunches of grapes and those grapes are uh, very very um, much surrounded by tiny little capillaries which are going to do the actual work of uh, swapping out air here's a blow up version of it so you can see uh, oxygen poor blood in blue uh, and oxygen rich blood in red and uh, capillaries surrounding the alveoli and the alveoli are just they look like bunches of grapes and again it's the inverse square law the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide across moist respiratory surfaces takes place entirely by diffusion the inverse square law dictates the rate of diffusion to be proportional to the surface area and inversely proportional to the square of the distance traveled so gas exchange is fast when area for diffusion is large and the distance is short so respiratory surfaces therefore are very large and very thin Alveoli are air sacs that terminate a bronchial. They look like bunches of grapes and they're about a quarter of a millimeter in diameter. Therefore, they, their surface area is huge. Millions of alveoli have a surface area of 100 meters square, which is about 50 times the surface area of our own skin. So you can see how much is packed in inside your lungs, a lot and the diffusion is due to partial pressure what is partial pressure so let's look at it blood arriving in the lungs has low partial pressure of oxygen and a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide relative to the air in the alveoli in the alveoli oxygen diffuses into the blood and carbon dioxide diffuses into the air in tissue capillaries partial pressure gradients favor diffusion of oxygen into the 
interstitial fluids and carbon dioxide into the blood. So how does respiration occur? Let's see. Oxygen in the air of the alveolus dissolves on the moist film on top of the alveolus and rapidly diffuses across the epithelium into a web of capillaries. Diffusion of carbon dioxide occurs in the opposite direction. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in alveolar capillaries is higher than the air in the alveoli, so it will diffuse down the pressure gradient. And partial pressure of oxygen is lower in capillaries than in the alveolar air, so oxygen will diffuse on in. And then you would wonder, how do alveoli stay inflated like bunches of grapes? So like when we breathe out, what happens to them? Did they get squashed? No, they don't. Moist film on the surface of the alveolus has a surfactant. So it's surfactants are soaps, which help keep the alveolus maintain its shape and not deflate under pressure. The surfactant is made out of phospholipids and proteins, and it reduces the surface tension. Uh, surface tension, remember, is the cohesive force exerted by molecules at the boundary between two media. So remember, we looked at this. Um, that's surface tension. This could be a beaker of water, and um, the molecules um, like to attract to each other. And so they're, they're, uh, there's tension uh, or attraction between them. And what is pressure and partial pressure? So I didn't go over that, but let me talk about it. Um, pressure, we know, is one atmosphere. We just have the one atmosphere. So we call it one atmospheric pressure. And that's a sea level. That, that means that if we assume that the top of your head has an area of, let's say, 0.1 square meters, that's about an approximation, then you're carrying around on the top of your head at all times the equivalent of a small car or about 1,000 kilograms of air. Uh, because the column of air is going from your head all the way up uh, to the space station, so um, which is really not space. It's only like the distance from here to New York or New Jersey, and so about 240 miles. So you're carrying that. And we don't notice it because our bodies push out at the same force to balance it, so that's atmospheric pressure. And what is partial pressure? Partial pressure is simply the pressure of one gas in the atmospheric mix of gases. Remember, the atmosphere is a mix of about 78% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen. Well, the rest is all, and the rest is just trace gases, the 1% that's left over. So at sea level, the total atmospheric pressure we just said was one atmosphere, and that is about 760 millimeters of mercury. So the partial pressure of oxygen is just going to be that fraction of oxygen in that one atmosphere. And we just saw that it was 21%. So 760 times 0.21, it's just going to be about 160 millimeters of mercury. So out of the 760 total, only 160 is oxygen. All right, so then that means um, this is 600, which is from nitrogen. Um, the partial pressure of oxygen is written as P sub O2, um, and that would be 160 millimeters of, of mercury. Um, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is uh, only 0.29 millimeters of mercury, and that's considered a, a trace gas. And so um, in the lungs, we don't have that partial pressure uh, of, of uh, um, oxygen. It's much lower in the capillaries, so it's easy for the oxygen to move out from the interior of the alveolus and into our capillaries. All gases still have to be soluble for the cell to be able to use them, so those concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide are different because they also have to dissolve in that little film um, that's on the surface of the cells of the alveoli, and um, that is a different property. So diffusion is one property, but they have to dissolve in that uh, that uh, liquid. Um, and the solubility of every compound is different. Carbon dioxide happens to be 26 times more soluble than oxygen in water. So a lot of carbon dioxide can dissolve in water um, 26 times more than oxygen can. So oxygen isn't the best um, 
candidate should dissolve in water, but it'll do it. Uh, please check this link. This is an Khan Academy link, and it's a really good one um, to show you about the uh, respiratory system. So please take a look at it and come back to me. Um, we are looking over here at uh, this um, diagram that I took from your book, and it shows you the partial pressure of uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide um, that uh, we just talked about and how it changes in the alveolar spaces uh, because um, uh, the pressure gradient of the atmospheric oxygen uh, is much higher in uh, the alveolar than it is in the capillaries and uh, the reverse is true of carbon dioxide and so when we exhale it um, it all goes away. So this just shows you that. Um, let's see, these alveoli are very precious, so we should be protecting them, no? Um, but they don't have any villi or they or have any cilia. So no hair, no nothing. Uh, so they're targets for bacterial contamination because we're taking in a breath, um, we take about 12 breaths a minute. So that's a lot of bacteria just streaming on in. So we have a lot of white blood cells patrolling the area and they engulf foreign bodies. They just sit there and they eat up any bacteria that show up. And they do show up. White blood cells are present in lymph and they also squeeze out of the capillaries into the interstitial fluid bathing the alveoli. There they do their job. Negative pressure breathing, what is that? We do that. We employ negative pressure breathing. This means that we pull air in. We don't push it in. We pull it into our lungs. And the way we do that is we expand our thoracic cavity by active muscle contraction. That increases the lung volume. Um, and that is when we actually take in a breath or inhale air. This is going to lower the air pressure inside the lung. So air always flows from an area of high pressure to an area of low pressure, so the lungs are going to fill up with air, yes? Um, and this is a picture of negative pressure breathing. The first picture shows you inhalation, where um, you're taking in air and uh, you're increasing your thoracic cavity. Um, notice the diaphragm has gone from here down here. Um, so you're increasing your cavity, and so there's less pressure inside. So air is just going to rush on in. And then when you exhale, um, the picture on the right shows you the diaphragm moving back up. Um, and so the air is uh, just expelled outside. Exhalation is therefore passive. The muscles are just relaxing. The thoracic cavity will just get reduced. The air is going to be forced out. And we can never over exhale. Um, there is a negative feedback loop that prevents over expansion of the lungs and over um, doing anything. So we have these that, um, that will keep it in balance. So we can't keep on ex inhaling. Um, there's a limit and then we can't keep on exhaling, there's a limit. However, not all the air leaves completely. So remember there's all the alveoli are still inflated, which means they still have air in them. So not all of the air left. So each breath we take will mix in fresh air with oxygen depleted air or old air in the alveoli. So the maximum partial pressure of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the lungs is always always going to be different from the atmospheric values, always. It's not going to be the same because we have some old air still in our lungs. Exhaled air will pass over the vocal cords in the larynx to create sounds, and that's how we talk. Um, cilia and mucus line the epithelial of the air ducts and move particles up to the pharynx. And this is called a mucus escalator, and it cleans the respiratory system and allows particles to be swallowed into the esophagus. Um, so uh, when we clean our air, um, where is that stuff going to go? The mucus is going to trap all that gunk. Um, we just take a, we swallow it, and we don't even notice it. And it goes in our stomach, and um, uh, there it's sterilized and killed, and uh, we're good. Let's look at some terms again. Um, tidal volume is the volume of air inhaled and exhaled with each breath. Average tidal volume of a person is about 500 milliliters. Not that much, 
Vital capacity, that is the tidal volume during maximum inhalation and exhalation. So sometimes if you want to take a really deep breath and a really big exhalation, you can get up to maybe four liters. You could. Uh, but the residual volume, there's always air remaining in the lungs after uh, forced exhalation. That would be called the residual volume. So if we finally get to the control of breathing, where is this um, control? Because every system has its control and everything is controlled by the central nervous system. Well, the control of breathing, like the control of um, uh, the circulatory system, is also involuntary. Um, and the control of breathing resides, uh, there's a center, and it resides in the medulla oblongata. And uh, this center regulates breathing by sensing the carbon dioxide levels in the blood uh, with the pH. It senses the pH um, and it recognizes is it too acidic, is the blood too acidic or not too acidic. And then um, you either breathe more or faster or you breathe slower. So the depth and the rate of breathing brings back the control of breathing to normal levels. And that's what the center does in the medulla. So here is the medulla. So notice that this is our uh, cerebrum. Um, this is our cerebellum. This is the back of our head. Uh, it is for our uh, balance. And then this is our spinal cord. And the medulla is here, so kind of tucked away. We don't want um, this to be easily accessible because if we don't breathe, then we die. So we want this to continue. And um, that is why it is uh, deeply buried. The control of breathing, this is uh, showing you the, the feedback loop. So the normal blood pH is about 7.4. If the blood pH falls because we have too much carbon dioxide in the tissues because we've been running around too much and then uh, and the medulla is going to de detect that and it is going to say aha um, and it will then um, tell the uh, uh, it will send some signals to the diaphragm and they'll say well breathe more and faster so that you can take in more oxygen so you can get rid of all this excess carbon dioxide so that our pH can come back to about 7.4 which is where we would like to be. So that is the control of breathing. The role of hemoglobin needs to be gone over one more time because it's so cool. Without hemoglobin our hearts would need to pump blood at the rate of about 555 liters per minute. Um, because only 4.5 milliliters of oxygen can dissolve in one liter of blood. We only have 5.5 liters. We can't pump 555 liters a minute. That would be pumping like crazy. We would have to take an awful lot of breaths. And that's why we have hemoglobin, which is a magical protein that can carry four molecules of oxygen, one for each iron atom. After one molecule of oxygen actually bound to one iron atom, the other three subunits will bind very easily with three more oxygen molecules. At unloading time too, this is very evident. After one oxygen molecule is unloaded, the other three follow rather rapidly. But um, there is also something else that hemoglobin does. In, if the in increase in carbon dioxide partial pressure of carbon dioxide um, is sensed, this will also promote a lot of unloading of oxygen uh, due to the decrease in pH. Uh, myoglobin, this is another protein. Uh, we don't have so much of it as diving mammals do. We do have myoglobin in our own muscles, but di diving mammals have a lot of myoglobin. They need much more storage of oxygen because they're diving and they can't keep coming up to the surface to, to breathe. And so in addition to hemoglobin, they have myoglobin and this doubles as an oxygen reservoir. We only hold about 13% of oxygen in our muscles, but diving mammals uh, can hold a lot more. Um, so diving mammals like seals can remain underwater for about an hour. Um, uh, some can remain underwater for about two hours, and some of them can dive about 1,500 meters. So they have a very high blood to body volume ratio. They have an awful lot of blood in them. Um, so they can keep a lot of oxygen saved up. Where do we store our oxygen? We store about 51% of our total oxygen in our blood. About 36% of our total oxygen is in our lungs at any one time. And then we store about 13% in our muscles. 
And the transport of carbon dioxide is kind of important because it's linked actually to this magical protein of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a very big molecule. It has many, many polypeptide chains. And the ends of the tails of those chains actually bind to carbon dioxide molecules. So we don't just expire it out. We actually have it um, attached, trailing to our hemoglobin molecules. About 23% of carbon dioxide is transported by hemoglobin this way. 70% of carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions in our blood. Um, and about 7% of carbon dioxide is transported by just simply dissolving it in our blood. Um, bicarbonate ions, we should think about those. Carbon dioxide forms bicarbonate with the assistance of an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase after diffusing from the plasma into the red blood cell and combining with water. The bicarbonate ions diffuse out into the blood. When these bicarbonate ions reach the lungs, the, partial, uh, the, the, lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen, carbon dioxide favors movement into the alveoli where it gets exhaled. And um, this, this is just the regular laws of diffusion. Um, aquatic animals. So uh, what they have are gills. They don't have um, such a big system, but they have very extensive gills. And gills are outfoldings of the body that create very large surface area for gas exchange. And ventilation will move the respiratory medium over this respiratory surface. So aquatic animals move through water or move water over their gills for ventilation. And they have a countercurrent exchange system, uh, which we use in many, many systems. Fish will use um, a countercurrent exchange system in their gills. Blood will flow in the opposite direction to the water passing over the gills, and blood is always less saturated with, water, with oxygen than the water it meets. And so this is a very efficient system to transport, uh, transfer something that the other system is lacking. In fish gills, more than 80% of the oxygen dissolved in the water is removed as water passes over the respiratory system. It's that efficient. So it's a very, very good system, countercurrent exchange. So these gills that you see, um, these, uh, they're, they're uh, maybe kind of uh, a pain to take out when uh, you actually eat the fish. But um, they're very efficient for for um, the fish itself because um, they can do this business of countercurrent exchange and um, just suck up the oxygen. In insects, they have a tracheal system, and that consists of a network of branching tubes throughout the body. The tracheal tubes supply oxygen directly to body cells. The respiratory and circulatory systems are separate. Larger insects must ventilate their tracheal systems to meet the oxygen demands. And here is a picture that shows you this. So um, here's the same good old grasshopper. And um, he has air sacs. Mm -hmm. And then he has trachea. Um, and then he has an external opening to breathe out, um, which is blown up over here. So you can see it. And if you actually looked at uh, a real picture, not a cartoon, you would see uh, this arrangement. So uh, these show you that um, uh, they respire in this fashion directly. How do amphibians breathe? We did talk about this a minute ago. Um, we said that they take a big gulp of air. Well, frogs will ventilate their lungs by positive pressure of breathing. Um, so they take a big gulp of air and they force air down the trachea. Um, so they don't do negative pressure breathing. Um, how do birds do it? So birds have to fly. And how do they breathe? So this is kind of interesting. Birds have many air sacs. Um, they, those air sacs function as bellows, which keep air flowing through the lungs. A breath of air is drawn, through the it's drawn in through the trachea into the posterior air sacs and it's expired into the lungs where gas exchange takes place. Then the bird takes a second breath and the air in the lungs is sucked into the anterior air sacs, which forces air into the trachea. And the passage of air through the entire system of lungs and air sacs actually requires two cycles of inhalation and exhalation. And air passes it through the lungs in one direction only like this. So here is a diagram and here is an actual bird. So he takes in 
uh, a breath, um, and then it goes uh, first to the posterior, and then it takes another breath and goes to the anterior. So um, this is how it, it um, works, um, and that's how birds are able to breathe.